Hello everyone, Top Hat Waffle here once again to continue working on our Counter-Strike Global Offensive competitive level. Today we'll be putting some lighting effects and looking further into lighting in our level. We're going to continue working off the level DE Metro that we've been working on, and we're going to pick up right where we left off after we placed some basic lighting entities inside of our map. To load the SDK tools, we go to the Tools section on Steam under your library, the CSGO SDK, and then Hammer World Editor. Once that's loaded, go ahead and load up your map, and we can begin. The first thing we're going to take a look at is Envy Sprite. Envy Sprite is a sprite texture that's placed in the world free floating. It's used a lot for lighting effects and glows around props in your level. We will add a basic glow sprite around this light model here with this regular light entity. To start off, select your entity tool and then drop a new entity on the ground. Double click it to bring up its object properties and change its class to Envy Sprite. Once we make it an Envy Sprite, we'll have this little red box with a white circle on the inside and a black circle all around it. This is the default for a Envy Sprite. We have to change its render mode to be able to get rid of this blackness behind it. When doing sprites with the purpose of lighting, there's two render modes that we'll typically use. The first one is World Space Glow. This retains a set size and will not appear to get smaller or larger when you move forward or away from it. As soon as we change our render mode to World Space Glow, and click apply, the blackness around the sprite disappears. The other option that we can use is glow. What the glow option does is it has the sprite retain the same size in the world no matter how far away from it you are. This gives you the illusion that when you're further away from the sprite, it's larger, and when you're closer to it, it's smaller. This is good to draw the player's attention to certain areas in the level. Let's set its render mode to world space glow and click apply. Next, I want to set the scale value. By default, the scale is blank. If we type one in and click apply, the sprite will get rather large. This does accept decimal values, so you can fine tune how big you want the sprite to be. 0.75 should be about the right size for this light model. We can also set the color value of the sprite. I find it easiest to just use the color value of the light entity that I'm pairing the sprite with. So if I select the brightness value of the light, just the RGB section, and then set that in the FX color on the sprite, and then hit apply. If we scroll down to sprite name, the default is glow01.spr. There's a large amount of sprites that we can choose from, and there is a number of preset glows that we can use. The glow that I'll use is sprite glow06. When we click apply, the sprite will change slightly. Next, let's put the sprite into place. You'll just want to take the sprite and place it inside of the bulb of your light model. One setting that we want to take note of is the size of glow proxy geometry. What this value means is how much geometry should the sprite ignore to render over. We need to tell it that it's okay to render itself through this many units of geometry. By default, it's set to two. I'll change this value to four just to be safe. If your Envy sprites aren't showing up, this is probably the reason. Next, I'll copy this entire sprite system and just shift drag it over. And I want to take a look at the FX amount. The FX amount value is essentially how much alpha the sprite has. It has a default of 255, which is full. To show you guys how this operates, I'll change it to 100 so we can see the difference. You won't be able to tell the FX amount from inside of Hammer. Click apply. Let's close that out, and let's see how it looks in game. Remember that every time you compile for lighting in CSGO, you need to use the full compile HDR only preset. Here we are in game looking at our Envy sprites. We'll notice that the one light with the higher render effects has a much stronger glow around it from the sprite. Part of this is due to how HDR is currently configured. We'll configure HDR in the next lighting video since that's more of an advanced thing. If we no clip up to these lights, we can see the sprite around them. And if we just want to make sure that they're working, we can type R draw sprites zero to turn the sprites off. We can see that the glow around both the lights disappears as we toggle this on and off. 
Envy sprites are a great way to make regular lights look a lot better. Playing with their render amount is also a very great way to add subtle detail into your level, though over here 100 was probably a bit too low. The next entity that I want to look at is called the Point Spotlight. The Point Spotlight doesn't generate any light, it just does a beam effect and a strong glow when you look directly at it. This is similar to how a streetlight could look when casting light down into the street on a foggy night. We already have our floodlight model here that utilizes two light spots and it's inside of an instance. I'll open up this instance, click edit, and we can add the point spotlights in here. I'll select this one light spot and just shift drag to make a copy of it quickly. Open its object properties and change its class to point spotlight. Click apply. And we'll notice that its angle is pointing up slightly. This is a small, tedious little issue that when we copy the light, it flips from pointing down slightly to now pointing up. If we get rid of the negative sign in front of the 4 on the pitch yaw roll, it will be facing down in the same direction as the light spot. Next thing I want to do is put it in place in front of the light model. You'll notice I have snap to grid off and the object still sort of moves on a grid. This is because with snap to grid off, the smallest grid size is still one. If the grid size of one is not small enough for you, you can hold the alt key on your keyboard to fully unlock the object from the grid. This should not be used with brushes and only with entities as moving brushes on the decimal size of the grid can cause issues down the line when you save your file. It's okay with entities, because if an entity moves a small fraction of a decimal, it's not going to hurt the visibility engine. So I'll hold Alt and put this in place right in front of the grill of this light model. And much like the NV Sprite, I want to copy the brightness color value from my light spot, paste it in the color RGB, and hit apply. You'll notice we also have the same FX amount. This does the exact same thing here that it does to the Envy Sprite. I'll change this to 200 as I think 255 is a little bright for this entity default. And down towards the bottom we have Spotlight Length and Spotlight Width. This is obviously the length and width of the spotlight. There's no way to visualize this inside of Hammer. I find it easier to set a value that you think may work than slowly tweak it over a few compiles. For right now, I'll set the spotlight length to 650 and the width to 35. I'll shift drag this one point spotlight over and rotate it into place and put it in front of the other lamp. I can save the instance file and then close it out. And inside of my master file, we have those updated. Let's compile it and see how it looks. Here we are inside a game, it's almost blinding to look at it head on, and you'll see that the point spotlight has two components. Here is the horizontal glow that I was talking about from the street light in the light rain, and when we look straight on, that fades out and we get this bright light when we're looking dead at it. We can't even see the light model behind it. If we no-clip behind this one, we can see behind it just fine. So this acts almost how a spotlight would in real life. After tweaking the values slightly, I now have the spotlight length at 325 and the render amount at 135, and this is a much more believable effect. You just have to play with the values to get something that you really like. The next entity that I want to look at is called the function dust modes. This entity puts little dust particles that float up and down that you'll see up close on lights in the real world. This is a very neat effect and looks great when paired with spotlights. This is also the same thing that you'll see near the windows and tunnels on Dust 2. We need to grab our trigger texture. I'll just lift it off of my spawn point here and then hide that. We'll place it in front of this light. Just create a new brush. I want this brush to be kind of a cone shape so it looks like the particles are actually coming from the light model. Once I have it roughly in place, I'll grab the vertex tool and select the vertex points at the back. I'll press Alt E and this will open the scale dialog. I can just click down a few times and it'll telescope those selected 
vertex points in so it forms a cone. With this made, I'll double click on it, press Control T, and then change its class to a function dust mode. I'll click apply. I need to grab the RGB color value from inside of my instance. So I just need the RGB value from the light spot. You may be asking, why don't I just put this inside of the instance? The answer is some entities don't perform what's called a collapse when VBSP compiles the level, and this is one of those entities, so it cannot be inside of an instance and work correctly. I'll paste the RGB color onto the particle color here, and I'll change the particles per second from 40 down to 25. I'm going to have a few of these, and I don't want to have a ton of particles in the level. With particle size, uh, smaller seems to be sweeter, so I'll do 7 for minimum and 12 for maximum. And then I'll just shift drag copy this onto the other lights in this area. These don't need to be aligned perfectly. Since they're particles, they'll just spawn inside this volume and they'll go a little bit out. No one's going to notice if it's a little bit of a unit off. Let's go ahead and compile that so we can see what it looks like. So here we are in game. If we take a look at it, we can see that the particles are kind of going a little wild. Let's go back to hammer really quick, select all of these, and there is the maximum particle speed that I'd like to change. To kind of fix these from going haywire like that, I'll set the maximum particle speed to 5, and there were also too many of them, so we'll set that down to 12. Now here we are in game, when we look at it, that is much better. The particles start to fade out when they leave the range of the spotlight, and that just adds a better overall effect to this entity. Again, just like you saw, you'll need to tweak these values to get them to be perfectly what you want. You'll almost never get the perfect effect on the first try. The last thing that I want to take a look at is the light map grid. This is how lighting is computed and stored for every brush face in your level. I've placed a forklift here and a few brushes just so we can cast some shadows on this back wall so we can really understand what this does. To view the light map grid, we change our camera mode from 3D textured to 3D light map grid. Each one of these squares or luxels has lighting information pre-computed by VRAD, the compile process for lighting, which is then stored inside the BSP file and recalled when we need to see that face in game. Let's take a look at the default lighting size of 16. We see that it's relatively kind of the shape of the objects behind it, but not quite. There just isn't enough resolution on those faces to actually show the information of the shadows. Back in Hammer, we can change the light map grid size by opening the face edit sheet. If I select these two faces, we can see they have a light map grid of 16. This is the default. It's smart, but not required to increase the light map grid size to a higher number, something like 128 or 64, to get these giant light map luxels. This will decrease your compile time and it is an optimization process to help your level run better if you set this on faces that aren't really seen or don't need the lighting information. Though it won't break the bank to leave everything at default of 16. In some cases you'll want sharper shadows. You can lower the light map grid to other values. 8 is twice the density of 16. We can see that there are twice as many squares or light map luxels in this back wall as there are on this side wall here. If we take a look at 8 in game, we see that the shadows are better than they were with the default scale of 16. Though we really can't see too much detail in the shadow, it's a little bit better. And here is light map scale 2. We can see pretty much everything on this. We can actually see the individual handles on the forklift. While this is a very sharp and detailed shadow, you should be warned that lowering the light map scale like this to a value of 2 increases your compile time and is also more demanding on the game to run. Under no circumstance should you ever select your entire level and lower the light map scale. That's ludicrous. Never do it. You want to pick the surfaces that will benefit from having a lower light map scale and then set them accordingly.
I hope you enjoyed learning how to create some sprites, some point spotlights for beams, some dust motes, and how the light map scale actually works inside of Source Engine. Thanks for watching, we really appreciate it. Don't forget to join us again tomorrow for the next one.